All right, this is the start of the lecture number four on the stats. And specifically, we're going to start out with number eight. Now, just to kind of recap a few little things that we had chatted about up till now, um, in the first three lectures we've gone through, we've gone through some of the materials such as, you know, where to install it, um, a little bit about, you know, what if what about some of these mercury bulb stats, uh, talking about anticipators, differential settings, cycle rating, uh, cycle rate adjustments, um, getting even into, um, you know, how to, you know, what about the cooling side, wiring, um, the colors of wires, and some single and dual transformer systems. And then even steps for installation as well as um, some of the wiring specifics and, you know, how you should handle some of those things. Um, anticipator uh, amperage measuring, heating circuit amperage measuring, whether it's Ford Anticipator or not. And um, just some of the basic troubleshooting applications, things like that. So um, what I, the next section that we're going to get into a little bit is on just some of the, um, just the functions and applications. So the first part I'll address here is the programmable stats. Now, well, not everybody wants and has a desire to have a programmable stat. Now, the beauty of this is that they have made thermostats that are that have programmable functions almost the same price as having a thermostat without any programmable functions. And those programmable functions can be either enabled or they can be disabled. So they can either run it like a manual thermostat or they can run it as a programmable. Um, so that part has really created some, some really good flexibility. And if a person chooses at a later time that I'll use, you know, I'll use a schedule because my schedule is such, um, that's great. And they have that ability to do that without putting a new stat on the wall. So that's kind of the, the one way I would look at that. The, the programmable thermostats that we have nowadays, you know, it's, it's, it's just because it's a programmable thermostat doesn't mean that it has to be, um, it, you know, usually when people associate programmable stats, they're thinking of some scheduling programming. And, uh, so I wanted to actually hit up on probably the most common uh, type of, of thermostat. So there's basically going to be what we call a 5-2 um, weekday, weekday and weekend type stat. But there's one additional one that I'm going to add onto this thing that um, would be probably appropriate to look at. And, um, and I guess I can put it over here. And that would actually be a 5 slash one slash one um, and that's essentially going to be the what I would say is the week weekday and weekend now let's talk specifically what the heck that means so the typical the typical 522 or 52 or 511 means that you're going to have what I would say is you're going to have the same schedule I would say definitely the same schedule for the weekdays and 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 basically I would say for the 5-2 you'll have the same schedule for Saturday Sunday as well so I'm gonna I'm just gonna put a note same um, schedule for Sat and Sunday so yeah, I guess I can do that for Saturday and Sunday. Now, why that is relevant and why that's probably important, and I'm, again, I'm going to put on there that is the 5 slash 2 is what that is. So that means Saturday and Sunday you have a weekend schedule and you have a weekday schedule, and you can have different settings for each of those, but not necessarily... Um, so your, your temperatures and your times are going to be the same throughout the week. But then the weekend, you have another schedule that you get to choose. 
So that's kind of one of them that you that you may that you may end up having. Now I'm going to go and expand onto this one here. So on that 511, um, I think a lot of the same things. You have the same um, you have the same schedule for I would say the week um, the weekdays and separate. Um, I would say separate schedules and temps on the the weekend whoops weekend days all right now let me get into this thing here I got to get that fixed up here come on There we go. There we go. Okay, so that's the five one one. All right, now, not everybody is going to have you know the same Monday through Friday schedule. And in fact, the, the, in the day that the days that we are in now, for people that are living at home um, um, and they're working from home and they're they may have, you know, maybe they work three days a week out of the out of the office or back in the office, and they're doing it. There are so many different situations there. Um, there's limited abilities that you're going to be able to do, limited capabilities with these five on ones and five two stats. Um, my, you know, my preference is to look at the um, at the ability, you know, when when another option is obviously to have a seven day type program amount. That's the challenge you run into on a lot of these things on a seven day stat is going to be, you know, you can, the beauty of it is you get to have a, you know, you get to pay it, basically have a, um, a separate uh, schedule and temps for um, every day, which is pretty nice. It doesn't matter if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it might be, you get to have your own schedule your own temps, everything on there on those on the all every seven of those days. So that's kind of the norm. Um, and a lot of the, like I said, it's um, a lot of the stats now have given the ability to, you know, set up those, but they don't all have the capabilities to give you seven day programmable. That's usually something on the, maybe the slightly higher end. Um, typically it involves, com you know, for a lot of people it involved a commercial a commercial thermostat a commercial thermostat was always seven day and um, that's typically what was put and uh, if you so if you wanted in residentially you wanted a seven day programmable schedule or, or thermostat you were buying a higher end commercial thermostat is in order to get that so that's kind of some of the the scenarios in there but that's typically what they mean by that all right let's get into the next one here so your typical residential commercial you know setback time schedule temps and those types of things so um, I think what I usually like to do you know is is let's first identify some of those you know what are some of those those zones or those so if you think about you know what am I going to need and this is something that you guys are going to be programming in your uh, with your stats so when you think about you know the very beginning of the day so there's typically going to be a awake schedule is one, so that's kind of one. You're going to probably have a leave, assuming you're leaving to go to work. You're going to have yourself, you got the wake, you got your leave. Then, of course, at some point, you hope you can return from work. So that's the return. And then there will be another area that says sleep. Okay, now, in every one of these scenarios... Um, you could have a heating or a cooling setting in every one of those. Now, this is what I'm giving you is the typical residential type scenario. And um, some of those, you know, some of the programmable, obviously in a, in a situation for a commercial thermostat, there, the assumption is you're not needing a sleeping mode. So you're really, some of these that you don't use, you just kind of don't program anything in or you just skip that. And so you can you can manipulate whether you're going to use certain schedules or you're not going to use certain schedules. 
And then, of course, um, from the heating, and I'll use the H for heating. So this is so, you know, really dependent on what you want to do. So what some people will tend to do is they might say, you know what, I want to warm it up to 70 degrees um, in heating and for cooling, they, you know, for your wake temp. Um, you know, or, or the other option is, you know, and they might say, all right, for cooling, um, when I wake up, I'd like it to cool down to maybe 70, you know, five degrees or as an example, 74, 75 degrees. You know, it's just, it's just one of those things. Now, when you leave, then the approach you take is, all right, so what would I set my house if I'm going to leave and there's nobody going to be there and I'm not worried about you know what it's going to this is really what we refer to as almost like my set back temp so when I leave you know hey maybe I'll set it to 60 degrees and I'll let it go to 60 degrees Fahrenheit as an example and um, maybe for cooling quite possibly um, when I leave hey I'm gonna allow the, the house to warm up to 85 degrees Fahrenheit now no matter what you decide on your settings these are all things that you have to consider the type of scenario or the type of heating system that you have. So, and how long it's gonna to take to recover. If, if that house, let's say if it warms up from 74 and goes up to 85 degrees and it gets up that high or 90, are you, is your cooling system gonna be able to pull that house back down by the time you get back? So this is, these are gonna be what we call setback temps. All right, now, your return setting so for heating so when you return from work what do you want it to be at so you know for some people they might say well I'm gonna I want it to be you know 70 degrees when I come back to work or they might say I want to warm it up to 72 or whatever it might be as an example this is all kind of personal preference um, even like wake so I know people that they like it to be 74 degrees in the heating mode when they are waking up and they want it to, uh, and because they want to wake up and have the house warm and when they when they return from work they don't care if it's a little bit colder that's just the preference thing and then um, and, but that's essential what you do on the return side and then obviously on the sleep mode um, whoops I'm sorry uh, the cooling mode for returning that's gonna be typically again you know what do you what do you maintain your house at so maybe I set mine to 75 degrees as an example and then my sleeping mode, so this is one of those where, again, very much a, a customer preference. So um, a lot of people tend to like house a little bit cooler when they're sleeping. So they might say, well, I'll set it to 65 degrees when I'm sleeping. Um, now, I, I'm sure some of, some of you might even know people that they don't warm their house up any more than 64, 65 degrees. And they set it back to 60 degrees when they sleep. Um, it's a preference thing. So you just have to find out, you put in typicals and, and you talk to the customer, you know, what do you like your house set at? And then you kind of go through that. That's a little bit of part of the education of uh, what normally happens when uh, you put a new thermostat in for a customer. And then of course, cooling. Um, this is one of those where I don't like the house or my house getting up too warm when I'm sleeping because I want to sleep, so I like it actually a little bit on the cooler side. So I may, you know, maybe I want to leave that to the 75 degrees and I'll, I'll leave it that way. So I think the point that I'm making in all these temps in here, a lot of this is really personal preference. When you're leaving, you're assuming nobody's occupying the building. When you're sleeping, what are you comfortable at sleeping in? When you're waking, what do you want the house to be at or the building to be at when you wake up? Um, typically, you're talking residentially and commercially, you know, uh, or even when you talk about return, what do you what do you want it to be at when you get back from work? And and those are those typical ones that you have to do. Um, the other thing that you know that I would that I would identify is um, um, again you have to. I, I would I, I really just typically. Just say, you know, discuss these with, um, you know, with the customer and because they may or may not, they might want to know how to change them. And what happens is if you, you know, if you, you set it up and they don't like it, they're going to just simply use that thermostat as a manual thermostat. And they're, they're not, they're going to be very frustrated with that. 
if they don't know how to change any of the settings or the times and those types of things. So you got to discuss those with the customer. All right. So let's talk about item number 10. And item number 10, interestingly enough, is talks a little bit about an adaptive intelligent recovery control. And another word for this is called optimum start. Now what's interesting about optimum start, well, commercially in our, with our building automation systems, we always use um, this term called optimum start. And what it did is um, it was a way to start the system earlier so that if you want the building to be occupied and you're gonna and people are showing up to work at let's say seven o'clock what it will do is it will automatically figure out when to start the system so that it is up to set point at the start and not way before not hours before so it's trying to use smart recovery what different manufacturers do different terms on there is what they they talk about is um, they will use like Honeywell I think is they use this term called um, adaptive intelligent recovery control is what they might use as a term um, and it's essentially um, just a way to kind of it's an energy saving device on there not a bad really not bad to do that and and again it's a I would say it's an energy saving um, control mode. Now, I don't personally have a, I, I really like having the adaptive control. Um, and if I set up a schedule, I, I'll use adaptive every time. If there's very little reason why I would not want to do that. So I would say, you know, if it's available, I'd say use it. So what's the alternative? So let me, let me, let's think about this. So I tell you what, I'm going to come back to that number 10 on there. Um, and this would also, they also even do, um, commercially we would always use a, a programming mode called Optimum Stop. And, but uh, that's uh, residentially and on the thermostats. I don't typically hear that used. Um, adaptive recovery is normally what we would, uh, we would talk about. So let's go on to number 11. Number 11 talks about the conventional recovery. So... Here's the thing, uh, conventional recovery, if you don't want adaptive and you want more of the conventional, what you're getting is this. When you program your schedule, and everything I'm talking about here, the last two, number 10 and number 11 here, they will affect how you're gonna do your programming. So let me explain. So if, let's say that I'm going to be leaving or I'm gonna be returning from work at five o'clock in the night or five o'clock in the afternoon. Here's what will happen. With adaptive recovery, I program it at five o'clock. I say I'm, I'm using adaptive control. So my return temp time will be 5 p.m. That'll be my return time. The system will automatically figure out when it needs to turn on to get it up to temperature at 5 p.m. All right, now let's talk about the conventional recovery. The conventional recovery is you, so in other words, here's the question you have to say. All right, I'm going to return from work at 5 p.m. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a note in there. Oops. All right, so example. Return from work at 5 p.m. PM. All right. So I would have to know, I would have to know how long um, it will take to um, heat my, my building. All right. Now here's the problem. What about when it is 20 below zero, 10 below zero? Let's say my design is 10 below zero. Now, it will likely take, if I got to recover 10 degrees or 15 degrees of setback, 
I will probably have to do this. I will probably have to start it two to three hours ahead. So I might be setting it up, you know, um, I'm going to have to maybe program my start, um, my return, whoops, my return recovery time to, you know, maybe 2, let's say 2.30 p.m. as an example. So I might be saying I'm going to need two and a half hours to get that building up to temperature. All right, now here's, that's where the problem lies. So it's going to take two, it'll take, if it takes two and a half hours at that temperature that you're setting it back because you want it to be up to temperature by five. Um, so I'll say, you know, uh, program my building recovery time. Um, it assumes the max, I would say maximum recovery time is needed. All right, now at design conditions. Now, all right, so now let's let's talk about this. What do you do? All right, so a day like today, it's 45, 50 degrees outside. I don't need my system kicking back on at 2.30 p.m. That's where the problem lies. So in other words, it's kind of a waster of energy to some extent. So um, your thermostat, if it were using adaptive, would have then figured out that, hey, I, you know, because of how warm it is or cool it is outside, I can, I only need a half an hour to get it up to temperature rather than to have the building up to temperature. And that's the one thing that you'll have to kind of, you have to know a little bit about. So this one, I think that with the conventional recover, recovery is, is you're always, I guess to some extent is, you're always, um, let's just say you're guessing at the time required to recover. That's really what it comes out to. So you're, unless you're gonna go in and program it all the time differently and nobody's really gonna do that, um, you can let the electronics do this one. So back up on, on here, is you know you're simply you're going to program the return times and you let let the thermostat um, you kind of determine when to you know just re, re, you know basically the recovery time that's really what has to happen so it's just it's a smart way that's why they call it a, it's a smart control and uh, that's kind of the, the big thing on there. But that's a, like I said, everybody has that, uh, that function in there. Now, you know, the, it's challenging. I would say programming, programming is challenging. So the, the problem you run into is programming and using schedules for people that don't have a set schedule can be really tricky. And uh, so some people will just kind of use it as I'm going to set it back when I need to and I'll, you know, and, and um, I'll, they'll run it as a manual. Now, there are ways around that. And um, there are some other options that, whoops, there are some other options that, that we can use on here. So I will, um, um, I'm going to do this here. And I'm actually going to make, I'm going to actually add an additional line on here. And uh, so you guys can have that on here. I'm gonna put this as a as a 11, well, I'll just do, a, I'll do 11B as an example. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna specifically add this line. It's called, um, you know, geofencing. Now I'm gonna talk about some of these other things and um, as, an, as another function is uh, I'm going to just say, and I'm going to actually put this note on here about web and geofencing as an example. Now, they are different. Those two don't mean that they're not one and the same. But um, the with geofencing specifically, it kind of uses, um, it uses your, um, your cell, 
cellular position to uh, determine um, when to recover. So, um, whoops, when to recover. So that's one thing on the, for geo. So I'm gonna put a note in your geo. So geo fencing, it's using, uses your cellular position to determine, you know, when to recover. So it, it kind of picks up, hey, I'm getting close to my building or close to my house or close to home and you have to set this all up. Um, you know, that being said, you get close to your home and recognize, hey, it's close, let's get started. The challenge that you have is if you work close to your home, um, the, it may never have enough time to recover. So that's kind of one of those things that might be an issue. For, um, for the web, the web uh, uh, type thermostat, um, you know, you could simply just remote, you could remote in um, to adjust, um, you know, I would say adjust temps as a, you know, so a good example of this is, uh, you know, if you have a, an individual that has, let's say, um, a house or a cabin or their schedule is so inconsistent, um, and it's like, well, they don't, you don't need to be having a set schedule. So what you can do is just go in there and, and, and uh, you know, hey, we're going to run up to the cabin or we're going to, um, I'm leaving work late or I'm leaving work early. And you can manually adjust those temps remotely, you know, usually, um, you know, with your phone apps and things like that, phone slash computer apps. And it's, it's pretty amazing uh, what we can do nowadays. I mean, so... And again, you guys will do this. You'll set these up. I'm going to have you guys do an actual um, uh, an installation where you'll where you'll set those up. But they're they're phenomenal. I mean, they also can be very energy saving. Most of the focus and energy programmable thermostats though do require the geo fencing. They don't simply um, they like that simply because you can. It's got some controllability, but it requires obviously internet connection for the thermostat. All right, let's take a look at number twelve. All right, so number 12 talks a little bit about outside air temps, inputs, and remote temps. So, um, you know, to make sure that they are functioning and working correctly. So let me share with you this. So they have um, a lot of the thermostats, um, not all, but some of the thermostats will use, they can use um, web-based, they can use like the, the weather uh, airport or weather station, type um, to get remote temps, to get outside air temperature to operate. So you can have thermostats that can actually look at the temps and use that for information to one to do recovery or adaptive recovery. That's one way. Another way is to actually have a, a hardwired you know, outside air temp input. And um, so there are some systems where it will be wired and others where it will be wireless. And it depends on the thermostat of what it's going to be. We also have other types of systems that will use uh, remote temp sensors. Now, no matter what you do, location you know, is imperative if it's gonna work correctly in that. So, and I'll give you an example. So, if we take a look at, at outside air temp inputs. Now, outside air temp inputs, typically you don't want it where you know, if we look at it, where to mount it, where should you not mount it? So let's hit up on a couple of things. So first thing, you know, where you might want to say it says mounted sensor where you can, you know, it says see figure 23 as an example, okay? So where it can't be tampered, you know, you're not going to be tampered. Are you going to get some good air circulation? Is it going to measure what the true outside air temperature is? Um, surface flat. Is your what's your distance? How far away it's going to be? As an example, this is just one example on there, and I can I'll hit up on other things. Do not mount the sensor in direct sunlight. So typically, that means that most people would mount it in a shade or in, in the north on the northern side of a building. Um, try to mount it where you're. You know, it says hot and cold blows on the sensor. Um, maybe it's you know um, you keep an eye on that if you're near like a condensing unit. Um, those kinds of things, a furnace vent, um, the exhaust piping in your furnace, stuff like that. You don't want to have it where it's going to pick that up. 
I also don't want to get it where you're going to get um, a snow bank um, that's going to that. So those are challenging. A lot of times um, what people will do is they'll mount them in that eave. So in this one, they're showing it's mounted in the eave. Um, that's kind of one of those things. Again, it, you're looking for a place preferably where it's shaded is normally what you want to do on there. So that's kind of the typical. Now, what about remote temp sensors? So, and this would be another one. So let's say you could have, um, there, it's possible that you could have a wireless sensor. So you might have the controlling part of a thermostat located in one area of a building and the remote sensor, what actually is sensing the temp is in another area. Commercial jobs oftentimes need to do this and they choose to do this. So they'll just have a sensor in the room and it's wired directly or wireless going directly to the main controller that would be back in the office. And uh, that's kind of one of those things. Convenience stores and things like that, they all do a lot of that stuff. So those are all, again, those are typical things that you have to consider. So one of the big areas that you really have to take note of and take a, and look at is, is one of them is called electrical interference noise. And, um, you know, they'll, it, it can be, it can really create some problems for you. Um, any type of electrical, any type of uh, things that can create problems with like fluorescent lights can do that. Um, you can have it uh, be problematic, problematic for you. Um, there are uh, like fan dimmers. I've had like fan speed controllers, uh, light dimmers. Um, that can create some problems in there. They create electrical noises that have this magnetic field that gets imposed on these other conductors. And uh, so the rule or, you know, that they tell you on a lot of these install manuals um, is they say, you know, keep your wiring at least one foot away from these larger inductive loads such as motors and line starters and ballasts and things. Now, I, I, I will tell you this firsthand, and I've had experience in this in uh, dealing with jobs, that it does not have to be a very, very powerful motor. I've had this happen where... I was dealing with um, with a, a ceiling fan, and the the dimmer or the the switch or the speed controller had imposed on a on a remote sensor that was probably six inches away. It was enough to impose that that current on that controller, and it caused all kinds of problems with that. Um, the only way that um, that I was able to identify the problem there with this application is we actually took an oscilloscope and looked at the signal on the actual thermostat and uh, on the actual sensor line. And what happened was this, the second we hooked up the, the, the uh, oscilloscope on that line, you could see the actual uh, frequency of what the speed controller was imposing directly onto the thermostat. And it was, it was really wacky. I learned a ton of, uh, on that problem with how how significant that can be. So um, when they talk about you know using shielded cable, shielded cable, it, it can reduce the interference if it's routed properly. If but shielded cable will actually not help you if you don't properly shield the use shielded cable. And I've seen I've seen in both cases, and they were all commercial applications where people had incorrectly terminated their wires and the shielding and didn't use it correctly and uh, you might as well not have even used it so you might notice that in a lot of the literature that they will they'll tell you you know do not use shield the cable shield the cable can be actually worse if you don't uh, terminate it correctly and if you're not aware of how to do that so that's one kind of one of those that we that we normally do with so talks a little bit about um, you know the uh, so the question about using shielded cable, you know, I think is, is great. It's, it's fine if you do it correctly, um, but there again, it has to be properly terminated. Erratic um, temp readings from sensors can occur. Uh, I have seen that firsthand on there where you'll have, uh, you know, the electronic controllers, they get these, these currents that are get imposed on these wires and, uh, and you'll never notice it. You'll never pick it up with a voltmeter. You'll never pick it up with uh, a, of a uh, like looking at current or anything like that 
the only way you'll see it is where you can look at the actual sine wave um, of the devices, and that's the only way you'll, you'll get them. It's just very, very interesting how that can happen. So they can, you know, they can happen on there, and again, you try to avoid those. So I intentionally try to keep my wiring, any thermostat wiring, any sensor wiring, I try to keep those as far away from those types of loads as best I can. So that also means that I try to not route it near it. Now, if you've got, if a lot of that wiring is done in, in conduit and you're running wires that are not in conduit, anything that's running in conduit, you should be safe because the conduit should be grounded and you shouldn't have that issue with it. But if you don't, if it's not grounded and your conduit is just hanging there, you might as well, that doesn't help you much at all in there. So there again, um, it's just one of those things. So be careful with those applications. So shielded cables you can use those they work great if you do it correctly um, you know they said talks about use use be sure to use wires that have cables separate from the thermostat cable so in other words you could have it where uh, you could have two or three different sets of conductors within a single cable and uh, that would be another way using twisted shielded cable is another way um, so that's again what what works really well on uh, to give you better talks about do not route temperature sensor wiring with power wiring. That's so true. Um, be, I would keep my sensor wiring away from my power wiring. Um, don't put it near contactors. Don't put it near light dimming circuits, as I talked about. Don't put it near your motors, welding equipment, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, watch your connections, your wiring. Um, try to avoid... Uh, you know, be very careful if you've got if there's building grounding issues, uh, you know that it's challenging on there. You're going to have issues with some of these things. So, there again, you really those that have dealt with um, building automation systems and um, you will you you will see a lot of things that will go on in systems. And if you just use good practices like they've described here a little bit, is to take and try to run your wires away from your power wiring that might be for lighting circuits or fan circuits and try to um, staple those wires away from those, you would be much, much better off on there. So as an example. All right. The last couple of parts here that we'll deal with is um, communicating stats. So I put a few, just a few notes here, like Ecobee makes a communicating stat. Honeywell has a, a vision, um, their IAQ stats there's a, um, you know, some of those stats require an interface module. Um, they're typically, you know, they're, they're, they can be web-based. Uh, they don't, they're not always. So some of these stats, um, you know, typically if it's a communicating stat, you oftentimes, it's typically going to be web-based. But, uh, and nowadays the trend in our industry has gone to very much internet web-based type control. So those are all examples of things to, to be aware of. Um, these, all of these are going to require internet connection if it does. If it's a web-based stat, typically it's internet capability that you need. So again, that's what you have to kind of ask yourself. Oops, annotate. So there again, um, internet, how are you going to get it? And uh, there are all kinds of different gadgets that they use in there. So, you know, internet connection. And, you know, now this is getting to be to the point now where you, if you have an internet connection, you're going to need, uh, obviously, you're dealing with a router. Um, you're dealing with, um, you know, it, there was a time when, you know, obviously some people still have modems yet. Uh, I'm not talking dial-up modems, but it could be DSL. It could be cable. It could be. A number of different ways you got to deal with those types of things. Um, there's other ones that use cellular um, as the as a provider. That's another way. So either way, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things that you can deal with in there. But bottom line is you've got to somehow be able to make that connection. You have to somehow um, you have to create um, you know let's call it a network to some extent. Whoops, um, a network for that system. Um, for a proper operation. That's typical. All right, so those are, um, you guys will be doing in class, you'll be doing a, an activity where I'm gonna give you 
um, a web-based um, type of an application and, and you'll do the wiring, you'll do the uh, programming, you'll set up a, a schedule, you'll set the whole system up. You'll basically set it up like you would have to do for a customer. Item B, Infinity Evolution. I'm just throwing out examples of proprietary type thermostats. Um, OEM examples are what we're talking about. These are specific to a manufacturer. They work specifically with certain models of furnace and oftentimes they will do it um, where they might have multiple staging or modulation or some a uh, little bit more advanced control. Um, those are examples. They oftentimes will give you diagnostics. So um, I know Linux makes a system that um, is very interesting. Um, um, they will send a note to, um, you know, they, they have diagnostic notes um, that go, that'll go to the contractor. Um, so what's interesting about that um, is that if, let's say you have a furnace and you have a no heat call, um, as soon as you had that alarm, the contractor that's set up in the program in the thermostat, they would get a, they would get a, a command or they would get a, a, a note and where they can make and, and reach out to the customer and say, hey, we noticed you had a fault code on your furnace. Um, would you like us to come out and fix that? And that, that's incredible what can be done in there. So um, there's other ways to, you know, to do that. And you don't all have to have that the highest end, but it's phenomenal you know, what they can do on there. Um, other things that they can do with... Um, some of these other thermosets, you know, they can control a lot of other devices without having, you know, just tons and tons of extra types of, of, of uh, wiring panels and systems. So they can maybe, um, they can have a way, separate outputs that are handle, that can handle, let's say, humidifiers or uh, maybe an ERV or an HRV, or they can go and maybe control an electronic air cleaner or UV light. So they can give you a lot of different things. So the control is, um, you know, it's really phenomenal how you can get endless, and I'm going to say simplified um, control in a lot of ways. And I think there's advantages to some of that. Um, there has to be a benefit to the customer. Um, and certainly the biggest one is the diagnostics one that I talked a little bit about here. That's really phenomenal. So, and again, diagnostics. Prior, they, they can diagnose the system prior to the customer even knowing there was a problem on there. So it's a really good one. The other thing that I do like about some of these other, um, other thermostats, now IEQ stats this way, um, the web-based stats can be that way. Some of these, they can actually, um, I had a, a situation where a customer wanted, they wanted that web-based control. They didn't want the fancy high-end stat if they could avoid it, but they didn't have wires and it was, there was, it was not possible to run any wires. All they had before was a simple little round Honeywell T87 thermostat. So we were limited to two wires. So the, the beauty of that is the IAQ stat that we were using gave me the ability to control the whole system by using only those two wires. Now, I wired up the two wires that went over to the and then it, it communicates electronically to what I would call an interface panel. And the interface panel is mounted right by the furnace. And it provided me the ability to control, um, have a lot higher levels of control with uh, minimal issues with that. But it's, a fina it's really phenomenal on how that works on there. So those are very, very good. They can be really good. You've got a lot of options. There's certainly add a wire applications that can be done, but um, not everybody wants, you know, is going to use that. So, um, all right. So um, I made a note on here about, you know, follow your know, wiring diagram and wire requirements. Does it require shielding? Does it not require shielding? Follow the recommendations on there um, to avoid it, those issues in there. So that's kind of one thing on there. All right. Okay, so a um, couple of other things that I'm going to hit up on here is specific to 
some of the wiring. So let's talk about this. So earlier I talked about wire colors and terminals and I made a few notes here and there. So some of this will be, will be similar. So your RC, power for your cooling. You're connecting to the secondary side of the transformer, your cooling system transformer. Um, your R, so that's your power for your heating. Connect that you know, to obviously the heating side, the secondary side of the heating transformer. Um, and again, we're talking about the low voltage terminal board on there. Um, the um, common wire, find out, so this one says common wire from the secondary side of the cooling system transoms. Now you might remember earlier, in an earlier lecture, I talked specifically about make sure you follow the rules or the recommendation of where they want that cooling, the common transformer connection to come from. Which of the two transformers is it pulling it from? You have to know that. So in, in this example, and I think, again, common wire, uh, here they specifically state that. And they say, okay, it's coming from the cooling side. All right, very good, now that we know that. The W, they're identifying in this example, they're just saying, oh yeah, that's coming from our, you know, that's coming from our, our you know, that's for a heat relay. Well, it doesn't have to be, but they're just assuming it's a stage one heat. Um, it's going to some, whether it's a heat relay or whatever it might be. So the diagram to the right here is, tip, is showing you these typicals. What a technician has to do is they have to look at the typicals of that thermostat and they have to identify what are the wires, what are the terminals, what am I looking at. So you'll notice on this on the stat that we're showing up here, they're saying conventional. And then so you're going to only then look at the conventional. If you're hooking a conventional system, you're not going to look at the other stuff that's on there. So this is typical hookup for a conventional single stage heat cool system with a single transformer, one heat, one cool. That's probably the most common system out there. So this one is indeed showing me the RH, RC jumper, as I talked about earlier. We, so R is gonna go to that, to the, to the heating cooling transformer. And the W is going to the, you know, in case a heat relay or heating stage one, the Y is going to a compressor contactor in this case. Um, G is going to go to a fan relay, and common is going to go to the common side of things on there. And then if they're using an, an indoor outside sensor or anything that they would use on there, then they're going to go to, let's say, an S1, S2. And uh, again, you have to follow those recommendations. Now, if you have a two transformer system, I want you to recognize and notice how they're, they're showing that jumper was taken out. And if you look at the note, it says remove factory installed jumper. Okay, if you're lucky enough to have that. And now you'll notice that you got one transformer to handle the, the common, to handle the cooling on side of that. You're basically now, the thermostat is smart enough to know that it's gonna run, it runs the heating side. It's gonna use the R from the heating transformer and it's gonna power up W and it'll take care of the heat relay, but the compressor contactor is getting the power from the RC. So that's really what they're doing. So RC doesn't mean hot and common. It just means the, the hot for the cooling side uh, of the system on there is how they're doing that. So when they talk about compressor contactor, um, compressor operation, the G is the fan relay, second stage cooling Y2, second stage heat relay W2. The OB talks about heat pump changeover valves. Now, in our systems, what we... Um, normally and oftentimes we'll take a look at that and there is um, a couple of things that I'm going to make note of on there. So um, you have to identify whether you're going to be, whether you're using the O or the B terminal. Now, typically, again, what you have to recognize is how are they doing the changeover? It's the changeover valve. It's the reversing valve. How are they configuring that? So for example, um, probably more often than not, I would say it, it's more typical in most cases, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a note on here, is, come on. I would say, again, more, more typical to energize the reversing valve
in cooling mode. Now, what that means now, and I'll make this, I'll adjust this. It's more typical to energize the reversing valve in the cooling mode. Now, what that typically will mean then, whoops. What that typically means is that will usually mean the O terminal is usually what they do. So they'll be using the O terminal on there. Now, again, you have to configure this in the programming. Now, there is a, um, there is a manufacturer that likes to use, um, I would say some manufacturers, now it depends. Commercially, I ran into it, you know, in all different ways, but I'm gonna say this. So some manufacturers, B is the terminal used. Now, what they're doing then is, that means that when, typically when they're using B, then it's basically, um, I'm gonna say B is energized in the in the heat mode all right now you might say well why what's the difference so what they're doing is is the is the old terminal typically what they find there we go so one of the manufacturers in particular that i could probably point out is um ream now whether they ever change that i don't know um, I've also had this happen with certain manufacturers on, on geothermal heat pumps. Um, commercially, there is no one way that they do this. You have to always look into this, investigate this. So what you got to figure out is this, is that when is that, when is that changeover valve going to be energized? And you have to kind of know that. So when we're saying in note three, it says if the thermostat is configured for heat pump system in the installer setup, you got to configure the changeover setting for either for cooling, either O or heat B. So when I say some manufacturers, B is the terminal U, is B is energized in the heat mode. So what the difference is, one of them would use fail-safe heating and one would use fail-safe cooling. So the most manufacturers use O as the terminal, which default basically is saying energizing the reversing valve in the cooling mode, the O terminal is energized, which then powers up the reversing valve. That means that if the reversing valve were to fail, it would default back to heating is what it would give you. Whereas the other manufacturers will typically, they can use B as the terminal. And again, you have to, you actually have to configure this and, and, and read through it and understand the lingo that they're doing as you're programming these. All right, the auxiliary heat relay. So they might have an auxiliary heat relay that could be used E for emergency heat relays, heat pump systems only, auxiliary, same thing. And then, of course, an L is basically like a fault alarm on there. So L terminal is an input system monitor when the system mode is in the heat off, cool, auto position. So L is a 24-volt output when the system mode is emergency heat. So it's saying it would be something to energize a light or to tell you, hey, I need indication that says we're in emergency heat mode. Um, something like that. And then S1, S2 in this example was for the other modes, um, but that's kind of an, as an example on there. All right. I do want to uh, make one other note here on some wiring in this. Earlier I was talking about the wiring in here, and I think it's relevant to go through and, and talk a little bit about that, is um, the, the typical application that we normally would be looking at here um, just to, to make note of so i would say and I, i've had this question come up a few times in here um, that's why i want to i want to make note of that so let me there we go and i'm going to just put on there is that usually um, 18 gauge wire that's 18 awg wire is good up to um, 100 feet. Now I say that simply because there are, now in here they're saying wire distance between the C7089U and the EIM is less than 200 feet. What they're 
they might, because of the ampacities they're running, they're not worried about a big amount of voltage drop. But for normal conventional sensor and thermostat wiring, that's usually what they'll do. So what, it, what I'm telling you that is, is normally what they would tell you is that it, it says usually 18 gauge wires get up to 100 feet. That means that if you're going and doing 150, 125, 100, whatever, more than 100, you're going to have to, you might be considering making that gauge wire bigger. So, you know, again, increasing distance, you got to go bigger wire. I know in my uh, apprenticeship classes, that's always something that comes up in troubleshooting is, you know, they're looking at voltage drops and how long are you going? And uh, so again, you have to look at that, um, how that would be. And um, the other thing that I was gonna point out is this, is that um, in a, um, in this, in the communicating stats, typically what'll happen is you might have a, like a, a box like a, a T-stat box. And then you might have a very limited amount of wires if needed, maybe two wires even, that would go to, usually they will require some sort of a, what I'm gonna call an EIM, an equipment interface module. And then from there, then that essentially goes to the equipment is normally how that would be handled. So just something to be aware of, uh, that you know those are the normal ways that they set it up. Um, again, it's a way to kind of limit the wiring they need to go in certain areas. So it's pretty, pretty amazing on there. There's just a couple of other examples on there. Now, so for those of you guys that don't have experience with this, um, this will be somewhat helpful. Um, I'm looking at a, at a, at a communicating thermostat here uh, or a thermostat here. And I want to point this out is you'll notice that there is in the same thermostat, they're showing you conventional and they're showing you heat pump. So conventional right there, and that's gonna use these, um, these, this would be W1, W2, W3, Y, and Y2 and G, as well as your, your R, C, and H, all these. All right, now, if you are going to be using heat pump, the same, this is how you program it. So the programming is, if you told it that you were gonna control a heat pump system, it is now using those same terminals to control o, the OB terminal, depending on how you configured that terminal. And you're gonna control the auxiliary terminal and auxiliary two and Y and Y2 and G. And so you have to know what it is that you're going to, however you program it, is how you're gonna to have to figure out what how it's gonna be controlling it. So. In, uh, and that's that's important for you to recognize it. So it's the same set of wires. So you could wire it one way thinking you're doing it perfectly, but if you forgot to tell it, oh, by the way, it's controlling a heat pump, um, and it's, and it, but it's really controlling a conventional system, things are not going to work right. It is not going to function correctly, and it's going to be a little bit of a headache. So sometimes some of your troubleshooting is going to involve I gotta get into the weeds here. I'm gonna to have to figure out a way to, all right, was this programmed correctly? And you're gonna to have to find out where that's at. So, and again, uh, it, it is very advantageous to look at typicals and try to see, do you try to find diagrams that are related to what you're dealing with if it's not exact? So you can make a, a logical decision on how to do that. So that's kind of the norm of how that is. So, but, um, Again, that's that's fairly typical um, to some extent on here. Yeah, again, that's the biggest thing that I that I wanted to to really point out so you um, all of you understood that these are really the same system. And I'm just going to put a line in here to separate these two. There we go. Eh, that's a little bit too big. Yeah, we get this one way or another, right there, right there. All right, 
So just that you have to recognize the same terminals are using both of those and, and that they have to understand the separation needed. So anyways, so um, the rest of the module um, that you guys will be working on and doing um, will be um, really on the lab type things. So this concludes the, the last of the lecture.